good morning distinguished invitees hope you enjoy the first and second, se second technical session that was held a while ago we will now commence the second technical session on defense and strategic studies for the 14th international research conference under the theme geopolitics and strategic groupings we have six researchers presenting their research findings here with us today without a doubt this will be an interesting and intellectually stimulating session i would like to call upon brigadier rg rajapaksha rsp psc dean faculty of graduate studies to introduce the chairperson senior professor naini melagoda dean faculty of graduate studies university of colombo big studies technical session 2 of the KDU International Research Conference 2021, in which the presenters will, will deliver their papers on the sub-theme, Geopolitics and Strategic Groupings. It is my pleasure to introduce the chairperson of the session, Senior Professor Nayani Melagoda, Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Colombo, to the audience. Nayani Melagoda is a Senior Professor in International Relations. She is the Dean of Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. She has completed her Doctor of Philosophy from University of Leeds, United Kingdom in 1989 and Masters from University of British Columbia, Canada. She has also followed the Advanced Diploma in Peace and Conflict Studies in University of Uppsala, Sweden. She is a country expert, Sri Lanka, on varieties of democracy projects conducted by University of Gothenburg, Sweden, 2015 to the present. She is also an affiliated researcher, Institute of Peace Science, Hiroshima University, Japan, since 2010 to date. She is also a faculty board member of the South Asian University in New Delhi, India. She is a member of Institute of National Security Studies, Sri Lanka, an appointed resource person for Staff College Butterland and visiting lecturer for National Defense College, Sri Lanka. She is a senior Fulbright Fellow and a Japan Foundation Fellow. Whilst thanking her for being here with us today online, accepting our invitation, I now cordially invite Professor Nayani Melagoda to chair the Defense and Strategic Studies Technical Session 2. Meantime, I would like to call upon our eminent guest speakers in the session, some physically and some online. Captain Rohan Joseph, Dr. G. Bignaraja, Dr. C. Atanayaka, Ms. D. G. and Sanjeevani, Mr. A. C. T. Piris, Mr. A. Senegiratna. Professor Nayani Melagoda will also introduce the presenters of the session to the audience. Madam, over to you. Thank you very much, Brigadier Rajapaksha. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be at the Kotalavla Defense University Annual Research, International Research Conference. So good morning to all of you. Uh, it is a privilege uh, and a pleasure uh, to chair this technical session two, timely uh, themed um, as geopolitics and strategic groupings. Uh, where six presenters will discuss their research done over the years on geopolitical influences on power relations in international relations. Um, specifically, uh, I hope in the context of Sri Lanka, in the face of Sri Lanka's um, foreign policy of neutralism. So therefore, uh, without taking much time, I would like to uh, invite the first presenter, uh, Captain Rohan Joseph. Let me briefly introduce you, Captain Rohan Joseph. Um, Captain Rohan Joseph of the Sri Lanka Navy uh, is, the, is at present the commanding officer of SLNS Rangala. He has specialized in navigation and direction in Pakistan, completed junior staff college in Sri Lanka and staff college in Naval Command College, China. 
He holds number of academic qualifications, amongst which, uh, from my own faculty, I think, Masters in Conflict and Peace Studies, University of Colombo, and postgraduate diploma in Security and Strategic Studies from the US. And he's the part, uh, recipient of six letters of commendations from various commanders of the Sri Lanka Navy for his exemplary performances. I'm not going to list all the medals of bravery you have earned, uh, Captain Joseph, in the battlefield. Uh, what he will be presenting on today, his research uh, titled Clash of Strategies in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Challenge of Preserving the Equilibrium. Over to you, Captain Rohan Joseph. The floor is yours. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I am audible, uh, session chair, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. The topic as mentioned by the chair is challenge of uh, clash of strategies in the Indo-Pacific, challenge of preserving the equilibrium. <coughs> well, we all know there's no other maritime space like the Indo-Pacific, which is so diverse geostrategically and geopolitically. And we also know in 2007, it was in Suabe that first highlighted the India, Indian and Pacific portions as seas of freedom and prosperity. But actually, it was Carl Hauser, who way back in 1920, really went on to forecast the renaissance of Asia through reflections of Indian-Chinese interactions, where he named it as Indo-Pacific space. What we see today is a fierce strategic competition to gain preeminence using different tools. So the sets of tools that I've selected is free and open Indo-Pacific uh, strategies. They have been used as a ways and means to exert pressure as well as to gain support. And also what we see is these strategies continue to clash, tilting the very important geostrategic balance in this region. Apart from that, this region has been divided strategically, uh, largely led by two groups of China and US. Uh, these strategy clashes have the potential to impact global peace and stability as well. And we all also know this led me to ask, asking the important question, how could these strategies and initiatives introduced by various players could impact the Indo-Pacific equilibrium leading to global stability. Uh, if you look at, I have taken some of the key uh, players, Indo-Pacific strategies and initiatives, US comes first. So some of the key priorities that they have highlighted in their strategy and policy documents are, they want to maintain strategic primacy, counter Chinese uh, predatory economic practices. And obviously they want to prevent China from establishing illiberal spheres of influence as well. Uh, US sees India as a major defense partner in this context. Number of uh, strategic documents, basically three documents have been introduced, uh, largely to reshape economic and strategic partnerships. But what I see is they have failed to articulate a comprehensive regional strategy looking at the Indo-Pacific. Then uh, it's Japan. Uh, Japan also tried to see or basically displace China from the equation and take a lead in strengthening security cooperation in organizations such as COD and ASEAN as well. And also, they, so, they too see India as a vital strategic partner. They want to engage deeply with uh, organizations such as ASEAN and the uh, ARF as well. What we see is uh, Japan wants to play a, a leading role in, in this growing strategic and economic relationship in the region. Apart from that, they really want to be the flag bearer in terms of regional infrastructure development, well, competing with some countries who are already here. Uh, now we look at uh, India, we all know India is a key player in ensuring strategic balance and also she wants to present herself as much more uh, reassuring uh, country against a scary China and also she's a strong player in the Quad and she also focuses on partnerships in defense and economics as uh, well. But what we see in, in terms of India is she's not militarily that much capable really stretching her leg arms away from her neighborhood due to obvious reasons and uh, many many cite us and japan using india to balance china's growing influence uh, through uh, the to india very importantly in their strategic documents the word inclusiveness is included it is essentially show that uh, india does not want to either sideline or contain anybody who is during in specific uh, looking at australia well, they have two dominant foreign policy factors, largely two approaches on dependent ally and middle power approaches. 
But we also see through their defense white paper, which was issued in 2017, is that they have mentioned China's growth is shifting relative economic and strategic way. And also they forecast future balance of power largely going to depend on actions of US, China, and major powers such as Japan and India as well. Uh, they are obviously looking at taking a, a, a serious leadership, especially in promoting health security in terms of vaccine diplomacy and other stuff in the present context as well. If you look at the 2020 defense strategic update, they are largely focusing on uh, further en enhancing and expanding regional defense partnerships as well. Well, China, we all know, uh, uh, you know, global and brand strategy is primarily BRI. Many cite China uh, by saying that uh, she is trying to monopolize some of the strategic choke points in the Indo-Pacific, and also uh, she is trying to Im impose pressure on US, Japan, and their partners as well. China too comes with a lot of problems. She has her uh, own problems, but Taiwan, I, I consider, is a big, biggest challenge in the face of West's Indo-Pacific strategy. And also, uh, if China is really thinking that she could, you know, basically control the entire Indo-Pacific, it, it's too large and complex. We know that it's complicated, and it's not, you know, essentially possible to anybody to uh, control by one single power. There's always the risk of overstretching your resources and other aspects. And in the long run, you will be unsustainable. And also, China has very, uh, very importantly highlighted that U.S. should no, uh, never break this region into groups and uh, create uh, cliques or a new Cold War uh, kind of attitude in the region. Well, I have taken some other players in terms of EU strategy is very important. They are looking at having a balanced effort to formulate a common position in the Indo-Pacific, and they do want to become a principal security player as well. And also, they want to actively engage in uh, security domain, especially in the uh, maritime domain field. And apart from that, France gives a different perspective. Uh, on the other hand, she wants to present herself as an Indo-Pacific power and very much concerned about the China's assertive attitude as well. And she too focused on striking and balance between the indispensable balancing act against China. Now, this is very important to understand. That's something quite different from the common EU stand. And also, uh, France want to emerge as a mediating, inclusive, and stabilizing power because France has already understood, and most of the countries in the EU have understood, the region is slightly becoming uh, imbalanced due to various reasons. And apart from that, uh, France is looking at improving regional military balance, once again, very important in terms of discussing the uh, balance in the region. Well, Germany, interestingly, they have not introduced a strategy. They have introduced a set of guidelines, and they do want the NATO to engage deeply with Southeast Asia. Uh, because Germany thinks some of the shifting geopolitical power structures in the Indo-Pacific is greatly impacting them. So that's why they are very much interested. And also, this is a time where Europe is collectively thinking something called the China problem. So Germany is essentially looks for, you know, not to take any sides, to largely uh, focus on strengthening multilateralism. And we have seen some events where when China started to engage in the European Union, that has created some division among regional subgroups as well. Netherlands, once again, have introduced a set of guidelines, and they speak uh, very strongly on the tensions in the South China Sea, not like anybody else in the EU. And they speak very strongly on the violations of unclosed and they want to ensure freedom of navigation, like all the other players want to do. And they do seek deep ties with some of the regional powers, ranging from Australia all the way from to Vietnam, countries like that as well. Well, there are a number of organizations that are actively involved in this, but I thought it's uh, pretty much important to look at ASEAN. ASEAN comes with a unique uh, uh, motto, ASEAN centrality. Now, ASEAN is already uh, in the verge of, you know, really in the challenge of preserving their centrality as well. Uh, we have seen uh, some of the ASEAN-led multilateral mechanisms are not essentially addressing the growing division among major players. So that's the concern that we have. And also, the uh, ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific clearly says that they want to promote maritime cooperation, uh, connectivity, sustainable development, and economic collaboration as well. Many cite ASEAN to be kind of a, acting a buffer zone uh, between Quad and China, but we have to see essentially how that progresses into the future as well. But one thing is very clear, if somebody is trying to progress in the Indo-Pacific without ASEAN, it's mostly likely to do unstable the region as well. So, we come to the checks and balances. 
we have two ends, two players, largely led by US and China. Then we have their Indo-Pacific strategies and initiatives. And then we have certain other players like Sri Lanka, Maldives, Seychelles, small, small island players, and a number of organizations falling under these two groups. What we see here is a very complex and a complicated uh, uh, interactions between these assets. Highly interwoven, highly dynamic, and that has an impact on Indo-Pacific equilibrium as well. What we see as a result, as a result of this, you will see the resultant forces of these two players. Uh, these uh, factors might be you know, high and low, and that largely will decide which side the balance is on. So this is essentially the findings and uh, research uh, focus on uh, my paper, and I have basically tried to apply balance of power as well as game theories into this. Well, I thought it's prudent for us to speak about Sri Lanka as well. Many partners, many players in the world have considered Sri Lanka as strategically vital partner. Why are we really important? That's a great question to ask. Are we being taken on a right? Or are we being, uh, have we been given the due place that we own in the Indo-Pacific? Or in basically in the Indian Ocean? Uh, that's, that's a concern that we need to really uh, be mindful. And also, we have to essentially be mindful of uh, Indian factor. We have to be very sensitive in whatever the strategies that we introduce or in whatever the uh, partnerships that we align with. Uh, well, people discuss about being non-aligned, but I, 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 I like to see it has been rightly aligned with whoever fits us. If a country A or B is matching our strategic objectives and goals, both long-term and short-term and mid-term, I think we should align with them. That's what I prefer to call as aligning rightly or right alignment. And also, we have small players like us have become uh, in a very difficult position because we have to maneuver among major players we have to keep both of the, both the ends very safe. So strategic maneuvering with other players is a big challenge for small island states like Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka has not introduced a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, but we have bits and pieces introduced in various places at various occasions. My proposal for a Sri Lankan Indo-Pacific strategy is shown here. I, I strongly uh, recommend that we should focus on establishing strategic engagement with all players, not merely a memorandum of understanding or defense agreements. No, strategic engagement gives you better options. So we, we have to go uh, through this initiative into that aspect. We have to be Indian Ocean centered first, then look at the broader Indo-Pacific focus. Apart from that, like all the other players, we should value freedom of navigation and rule-based order and other aspects as well. We have to become a vital partner in addressing maritime security issues because we have that potential uh, in all the aspects that uh, a country can ask from us. And unfortunately, we have not really marketed ourselves as a maritime nation, but I think through uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, we can really market on this and emerge as a maritime nation committed to specially protecting sea lines of communication. So this primarily brings to my last slide, we see the two groups some of the players will keep on adding and changing as well. And we'll see, we'll see some of the uh, significant players in terms of organizations who are there. I have highlighted COD because COD plays a greater role. And also, these are the uh, initiatives that they have introduced, either through defense white papers or various strategy and policy documents. So these are some of the uh, basic concepts and outlines that they have introduced. And when you introduce something like that, it is going to obviously impact maritime security and it has impacted already. Trade and energy transportation has been impacted to a great extent. Regional cooperation has been impacted. So what we see is regional peace and stability is affected as well as global peace and stability as well. So some of the small countries like us uh, are in a great hotspot. We are, we are in uh, selecting options. And because of us, there are certain uh, you know in interesting topics as well that have emerged. So these are also other concerns. But at the end of the day, as a result of all these interactions, uh, what we see is highly divided and a contested region. If the Indo-Pacific strategies and initiatives want to ensure that this region emerge as one of the most important geopolitically and geostrategically important region for the world, I think we have to balance the strategy clash. If not, we are heading for a disaster. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Would, um, I thank you for the very insightful and also very attractive PowerPoint presentation. Um, uh, 
I'm sure we will have a robust uh, discussion on your presentation. You highlighted the, the many uh, players on maritime security domain in the Indo-Pacific, but I must say at the outset, I do not <laughs> agree with you on aligning, especially uh, with what happened in Afghanistan. As an IR professor, I would go with neutralism, right? Strictly neutral, not even non-aligned, strictly neutral foreign policy for Sri Lanka. Having said that, I look forward for the questions and answers. Thank you for that uh, very insightful presentation on clash of strategies in the Indo-Pacific, uh, challenges of preserving the equilibrium. Thank you. Uh, may I now call upon uh, the next presenter, Dr. Ganeshan Vignaraja. Uh, let me shortly uh, introduce uh, very briefly Dr. Ganeshan Vignaraja is a non-resident senior fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Um, and he's a senior research associate at the Overseas Development Institute in London. Previously, uh, until very recently, he was the executive director of the Lakshman Kadiragam Institute of International Relations and Strategic Studies, where I was also one of the board members we have worked very closely, even having an international conference on uh, Sri Lanka, right? So um, uh, he's also the director of research at the Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo and a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund, Washington, DC. He holds a DPhil in economics from Oxford University and authored and edited more than 20 books including your most recent Connecting Asia and Asia's Free Trade Agreements. Dr. Vignaraja will make a presentation on reflecting on US-China rivalries in Sri Lanka in a post-COVID world. Dr. Vignaraja, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, for that uh, very nice uh, introduction. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be at this uh, KDU conference. Uh, may I just check that uh, people can see the screen? Yes, we can, and we can hear you. Great. Uh, so essentially, my presentation today is going to try to deal with uh, this very important question, uh, which I think uh, builds on the previous presentation by Captain Joseph, which is how small countries like Sri Lanka, or small powers in IR terms, manage their relations with uh, great powers. And I feel it's very critical uh, for small powers to do this because it will affect their future prosperity and also political stability, especially in uh, COVID times. And uh, this really kind of uh, brings out this notion of economic uh, security, uh, which I think is critical when you come to small countries like Sri Lanka. Now, uh, today, uh, this uh, topic becomes uh, very important because Sri Lanka has uh, sort of got on the radar of, of, of great powers, and there are probably many reasons uh, for this. Um, but by way of background, historically, as Professor Melagoda mentioned, we have uh, pursued a non-aligned foreign policy. Uh, indeed, from the time of Mrs. Bandar and Ayaka onwards, Sri Lanka was seen as a bastion of this movement. And uh, one of the early non-aligned conferences was held at the BMICHA in the 1970s. Um, we emerged uh, in 2009 uh, from a costly uh, conflict, uh, and in 2019, we became a, a middle, upper middle income country, which uh, is quite an achievement given that there was a long conflict. Now, um, this question of looking at uh, great power relations in Sri Lanka is done a lot in the literature here, but I feel what's lacking is really a, a comparative data driven analysis of Sri Lanka's engagement with the US and China. Um, and I'm going to try to do that uh, looking at the evidence. And I want to try to um, look at really uh, this period uh, for the last decade. And I'm going to use this tool of cost-benefit analysis. Now, cost-benefit analysis, as uh, many of you know, uh, is really a tool to analyze uh, decision-making um, and particularly which decisions to take uh, and which decisions to forego. Um, and it's, it's used a lot uh, in business. It's used amongst development banks to look at projects. Um, in the IR context, I think cost-benefit analysis can provide a comprehensive picture of 
the net impact, that is uh, the positive side, the benefit, as well as the cost of um, foreign engagement of a, with, of a small power with a great power. And if used well, this tool can help us compare, uh, say, a US-China relationship with Sri Lanka vis-a-vis -a, -vis a US um, uh, relationship versus another country, for instance. Um, and in this context, I'm going to look at uh, Sri Lanka's relationships with the US and China, uh, and I'm going to try to compare it and look at the costs and benefits of each of these uh, in three dimensions. I'm going to look at development assistance uh, as first dimension. Second, I'm going to look at trade and foreign investment. And third, I'm going to look at security cooperation. And last, I'm going to draw some lessons from Sri Lanka uh, for uh, small power, great power relations more, more generally. Um, Captain Joseph uh, talked uh, very nicely, I think, about uh, the strategic location of Sri Lanka. And this, I think, is part of the reason why uh, you know, great powers are interested in Sri Lanka. And, you know, we're 10 miles off the main east-west sea route, where 60,000 ships pass annually. Um, we are a few miles off India's southern coast, which I think is also very pertinent, because India is uh, uh, traditionally been one of the fastest growing economies in Asia, uh, and seen very much as uh, what East Asia would like to be part of under this rubric of Indo-Pacific. But the whole region, um, is set to double its per capita income by 2030. Uh, and therefore, you know, preserving this uh, economy and maritime space becomes fundamental uh, through sea lines of communication and so on. And, and Sri Lanka's location makes it very attractive to try to control this space at some level, or at least provide some um, uh, checks and balances if needed uh, as, as, as we go through. But this is only one reason, you know, location, uh, is important, but there may be other reasons why great powers may be interested in us. Uh, one uh, important reason is we are trying to be a, a regional trading hub, um, uh, both through logistics and finance, but also trade. And the logic of this was really that we were South Asia's earliest economy to open uh, to trade and foreign investment back in 1977. Uh, so that's a good uh, several decades of experience. And um, we have also invested heavily in container ports uh, in Colombo uh, and also the Colombo port city, which we hope will uh, enable Sri Lanka to become a modern services hub uh, and be attractive as a kind of a Dubai or South Asia, uh, having finance and leisure here. Um, we have very high level of human capital uh, compared to our per capita income, which is uh, shade below $4,000. Um, so this is another major reason why people are interested. People are always interested in new emerging markets, and Sri Lanka fits that bill, although it's been uh, this emerging market for some time. Um, a third reason, which I think is very important, particularly in today's context of the possibility of Sri Lanka being involved in a debt-induced recession in 2021. There's a lot of commentary about this if you uh, look at uh, academic work elsewhere and also the rating agencies and others. Um, and therein comes in China's dilemma of uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the narrative is that of a Chinese debt trap, particularly in uh, think tanks in Western countries. Um, and this narrative essentially uh, talks about China providing cheap money to Sri Lanka for unprofitable projects, uh, which in turn provide China with access to equity in some of these projects. And Hambantota the Port has been used as an example. Uh, I will talk about this in a minute, but the point I want to make about Chinese interest in Sri Lanka, particularly today, is to avoid this risk of Sri Lanka being in not just a Chinese debt trap, but also in a debt fueled recession. So China is particularly keen to try to avoid this because it doesn't want its own brand to be tarnished uh, by its lending to a country that would be seen in some cases as a basket case in economic terms. Uh, another reason uh, Sri Lanka is attractive to great powers is Sri Lanka contributes to global public goods. Uh, Sri Lanka, as everyone knows, um, uh, was the chair of the Law of the Sea Conference, which resulted in the UNCLOS, uh, this famous treaty that governs the maritime space globally. And Sri Lanka has traditionally provided a lot of peacekeepers. So these types of uh, political uh, goods are very important um, for, for foreign powers to be there. And then, of course, there are rivalries between great powers by the influence. Uh, and regional powers like India also come into this play. Uh, now, let me just try to uh, provide you very briefly uh, these three dimensions of uh, Sri Lanka 
US relations versus Sri Lanka, China relations. Uh, the first one is development assistance. And this is not just aid, but it also encompasses commercial uh, loans. And um, what's very interesting is since 2010, uh, both US and China have upped their game, uh, but using very different frameworks of assistance uh, to Sri Lanka. Um, and I think the, the technical uh, distinction between what is a commercial loan and what is an outright grant in foreign aid needs to be well understood. A commercial loan is one where uh, somebody will lend you money uh, for an interest rate of uh, possibly 6% over a fixed period. And if you do not pay back that loan, uh, you will suffer some penalty. So that is what a commercial loan means. Uh, grant aid is basically somebody giving you free money uh, without any conditions attached uh, to you using that money in some sense. Um, so that's the important distinction. And I think there's a lot of confusion in Sri Lanka uh, between these two types of assistance. Um, and that's one of the points at the heart of our development uh, and economic security. Uh, now, when you look at the Chinese relationship, we have had uh, commercial loans uh, over some time, um, and the numbers are quite staggering. Uh, $10 billion is what I make it um, since 2010 to 2019. Uh, and some of these have been at 6% interest rates. Um, and, uh, you know, that is quite significant. Uh, and China with huge surpluses found Sri Lanka and many other countries very useful uh, to lend this money to. Now, uh, this portfolio has uh, some good projects. Um, and, you know, the CICT terminal in Colombo Port is a very good example of that. That has enabled... Uh, transshipment trade with India, and half of Sri Lanka's transshipment trade is to India. So that's been a very important example of a good investment. Uh, the Norachole power plant is another one. Uh, I think it accounts for something like one third of Sri Lanka's energy generation, although it's a coal-fired power plant and uh, polluting in some ways, and uh, probably in the long run not good for our environment. We have to try to get into renewables. Um, now this debt trap uh, narrative uh, issue uh, is really something that has uh, come uh, and labeled Sri Lanka in the literature. Um, having done some uh, careful work on this, um, you know, some 10% of our debt is probably due to China. Uh, the bulk of our debt is uh, for commercial markets, uh, which uh, come from us issuing uh, international sovereign bonds. Uh, we have increasingly done commercial borrowing uh, from markets as well. Uh, and also borrowing from Japan, the Asian Development Bank, and the World Bank. Uh, but that number for China of 10% has gone up for some 6% a few years ago. And uh, this uh, risk of uh, commercial lending, uh, particularly if China provides more and more money to Sri Lanka on these commercial terms, uh, such as the China Development Bank loan recently to help the economy, uh, could uh, increase this risk of a debt trap uh, and could uh, prove very costly to Sri Lanka if we uh, don't uh, pay careful attention uh, to this. Um, now, uh, it's also uh, true that China has been very uh, helpful in providing us with vaccines uh, and some large number, it was quite staggered, some 22 million Sinopharm vaccines have been provided, a mixture of donated uh, vaccines and some purchased, um, and as well as PPE uh, and medical equipment. Now, we, when you look at the US, uh, the grant money historically was quite small, uh, some 463 million um, but then there was this uh, large offer of uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation grant, and uh, that was accounting to something like half a billion dollars. And that was really to uh, help us deal with bottlenecks in transport. Uh, and Colombo was seen and the Western province as a highly congested transport lag. Um, and also to help with commercial land administration. Now, uh, this grant, when you take it, is, is a gift uh, from the US of some 22 point uh, $4 dollars per Sri Lankan, uh, whereas the Chinese money that we have uh, taken is several hundred dollars worth of loans, uh, which Sri Lanka has to repay in the future. Uh, and that's one difference. So this MCC experience, um, I think, was a disadvantage to us because we, we probably didn't explain very carefully or studied it carefully enough and it got highly politicized. Um, and why it's a problem for us is Sri Lanka, you know, as everybody knows, only has 2.8 billion worth of foreign reserves. And this MCC money could have been very useful to finance some aspects of our development had we uh, done the right projects under this heading. Um, and the second uh, problem that it does is that it uh, contributes to a negative image of Sri Lanka, that we 
uh, I think one of the very few countries, probably the only one in the history of the MCC that uh, the board of the MCC withdrew a grant. And this case is being looked at very globally and acts also as a deterrent to foreign investors in Sri Lanka, as well as uh, portfolio investors, because they see Sri Lanka as an unreliable partner. And, and that's a really a, a sad label for a country that desperately needs foreign investment. Uh, what I think Central Bank Governor Professor Lakshman talks about is not non-debt creating finance, uh, which we desperately need uh, to keep Sri Lanka afloat and indeed pay our debts in the future. So uh, important area here is on development assistance and this distinction between loans and grants and the various risks or costs that can arise uh, if we don't manage uh, money carefully. And it can be uh, a lag and it can be something that stays with us for some time. Uh, Dr. Vignaraja, Dr. Vignaraja, I kindly request you to be a little mindful of the time factor. You are slightly exceeded sure. the time given. Sure. Um, 20 minutes, I think, per presentation. I've been on for 15. Uh, thank you. So when it comes to trade and foreign investment, um, we see again an interesting trajectory. Um, and I just need to bring up this concept of a trade deficit versus a trade surplus. Uh, and what is very interesting here is that we have a huge deficit with China, uh, which has doubled to $3.4 billion uh, uh, annually in the period 2017 to 2020. And deficits need to be financed, and they need to be financed out of our reserves. And our reserves are $2.8 billion. Uh, so there again, you see the risk of this Chinese debt trap narrative, uh, which could loom large uh, in the Sri Lankan context. Now, I should add, when we look at the U.S. relationship, uh, Sri Lanka enjoys a very large trade relationship with the U.S., and it's a surplus, uh, $2 billion annually powered by garment exports. And remember, surpluses add to foreign exchange reserves. Um, I won't go into the rest of this. Uh, Chinese have also provided FDI, but mostly into infrastructure projects. Um, and uh, in the U.S. case, uh, there is this lag. And in the U.S., the reason why the FDI is very small is because the U.S. sees Sri Lanka as a very far away, a very small market without a proper trade agreement, even with a country like India. And also the U.S. sees Sri Lanka as a country with a very uh, significant red tape around its uh, business regulation. We are 99th on the World Bank doing business index and therefore considered very business unfriendly. Uh, the last point I want to make is really about security cooperation. And I will only briefly mention that both powers uh, have been involved in this. Uh, relationship with Sri Lanka, and um, uh, we have had uh, gifts of different types, uh, ships, uh, big ships, and also we have had uh, training and capacity building. The real point is if there is a perception, uh, particularly what Captain Joseph mentioned, that we have to be very mindful of Indian interests, uh, the cost for Sri Lanka could be a growing Chinese footprint, which has led to security concerns in India. I think the Indian uh, Navy commander recently expressed some interest uh, here, uh, and this can pose big uh, problems for Sri Lanka. Let me just now end uh, with uh, just a very brief summary uh, by saying that uh, essentially uh, the concept of economic security uh, should be fundamental in Sri Lanka, looking at its relationships with uh, major powers. And I, I take the point about the Indo-Pacific and all of these uh, constructs, but I think we are not paying enough attention to our own economic security and how big powers uh, play into this. And we really have to look at this very carefully, otherwise we uh, may uh, get ourselves into some difficulty. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis, I think, uh, is very important uh, in international relations, particularly evidence-based analysis, such as the type I've shown you. Uh, and there are some lessons, I think, which are very important for us to look at. Um, and I think we need to do a lot more research on this. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Melendez. Let me introduce the next presenter now, uh, Dr. Chulani Attanayaka. Dr. Chulani Attanayaka obtained her PhD from Central China Normal University in Wuhan, China, um, and her master's in regional development and planning uh, from Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Colombo. I'm, I'm really, really <laughs> very privileged today to have so many of you <laughs> graduating from Colombo University. At present, she is attached to the Institute of South Asian Studies, uh, National University of Singapore. She has served as Director of Research at the 
INSSL and in various academic and research capacities at the Bandar Naik Center for International Studies and Lakshman Kadiragam Institute of uh, International Relations and Strategic Studies. And you have done a wonderful publication on China in Sri Lanka, um, analyzing Sino-Sri Lankan relations in 2013. Uh, Dr. Chulani Atanayaka will talk about security, uh, security implications of the COD, quadrilateral dialogue of US, Japan, Australia, and India, and the Belt and Road Initiative in South Asia. Over to you, Dr. Atanayaka. So thank you for KBU for the invitation and the opportunity today, and good afternoon from Singapore. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, so my paper as uh, uh, you can see on the screen discusses the implications of the COD and VRI in South Asia. I think some of the uh, my presentation also builds upon what has been so far discussed in this panel and perhaps might even overlaps with some of the uh, ideas uh, the Captain Jobs have already shared. So um, basically, uh, I will discuss how the current, uh, what is the security architecture we see in South Asia and how the placement of VRI and COD will have different implications. As we know, South Asia is a very strategically significant uh, region, but um, we are also one of the least unified uh, regions and the security flash point in the international arena. And we, we are also the most troubled region in the past century. And South Asia security issues are traditionally dominated by regional tensions, such as Indo-Pakistan rivalry, Sino-Indian conflict, nuclear proliferation, organized crimes, terrorism, etc. Having China and the United States intensified their security and economic interest in this region, um, they are also being added to the security environment in the um, region. One of the most uh, uh, significant uh, characteristic of uh, South Asia security is its lack of a common overarching security framework to address uh, its common security challenges. Um, something we see in uh, Southeast Asia in terms of the uh, ASEAN uh, Regional Forum or Central Asia, South China, um, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So amidst this backdrop, we see two regional frameworks, uh, Belt and Road Initiative and the COD, um, not only um, initiated by extra regional powers, they are also becoming extremely active in this part of the region. So what is the um, security arrangement we see in South Asia at the moment? For South Asia, institutionalized security cooperation is necessary, I think more than any other countries because of the challenges, but it is one, nearly impossible, and two, it's challenged by various conflicts and interstate complexity. But this does not mean that uh, there are no collaborative security cooperation within the region. The region has a structure of bilateral security cooperation, which is dominantly India-centric. There are a few bilateral military cooperations uh, which are non-Indian centric. For instance, uh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka have been working together since 1960s. And uh, between 2004 and 2006, the Nepalese monarchy developed military cooperation with Pakistan. And similarly, we see Bangladesh and Sri Lanka having, uh, in, uh, have been discussing increasing bilateral military cooperation during the recent years. India-centric bilateral security relations, on the other hand, um, looks very different. Basically, India has security uh, arrangements with uh, all of its neighbors, including Pakistan. With Pakistan, it has, for instance, like Hindu Water, Hindu Water Treaty signed in 1960s, Director General of Military Operation established in 1971, etc. And India signed a strategic partnership agreement with Afghanistan in 2011. It has security arrangements with Sri Lanka, which are very, very ranging from uh, supporting Sri Lanka to suppress the JVV movement in the south, uh, to support various Tamil militant groups in the early years of the war, then later sending peace force after 1987 peace accord, 
More recently, India trained Sri Lanka's military officers, conduct joint exercises, and share intel with regard to terrorism, extremism, and, and etc. Um, its uh, security arrangement with Nepal has been the most enduring relationship in South Asia. India has a veto regarding issues that it pertains as detrimental to its interests. So, for instance, Nepal requires India's consent when it comes to arms uh, purchasing and all. Uh, its ties with Bhutan are very similar to that of Nepal. In 2003, the two countries cooperated to destroy the camps of the Northeast Indian militant group and have who have camps in the southern part of Bhutan. Uh, India's ties with post-independent Bangladesh have been varied from time to time, depending on the leadership. Uh, basically, uh, during the Awami League leadership, that relationship has ties. Now, how it looks uh, when it comes to the multilateral framework or regional framework. Uh, South Asian security arrangement lacks a regional framework, even though we have SARC uh, as an organization since 1985. Despite having established this organization to promote regional cooperation and integration, the organization has failed to establish a regional framework to address common security challenges. The most important instrument on security cooperation, the Regional Co Convention on Suppression of Terrorism signed in 1987, remain meaningless because of India and Pakistan's inability to agree on the definition sorry, definition of terrorism, obviously due to their diverging opinion of Kashmir, etc. Member states interestingly recognize terrorism as one of the key uh, security threats, and they have also passed an additional protocol to the South Regional Convention, which is set to supplement UN Declaration 1373, but beyond that, nothing has been done. In a context where the region is more disintegrated and there is no common framework acceptable by all states to address security challenges, uh, external regional powers have more maneuverability to impact the security uh, and strategic environment. How COD and the BRI falls within this context? Now, BRI, as we know, is a connectivity project spanning across 60 countries with cumulative anticipated investment of about US dollar 1 uh, to 8 trillion. Initially, it planned to have its final destination in Europe, but in the recent years, we see that it is uh, extending to um, other parts of Africa, Mediterranean, Caribbean countries, Latin America, etc. It has uh, multiple economic corridors, three ocean passages, and basically a very expanded, expansive and um, um, large uh, project. While the Chinese government repeatedly highlights that the centrality of the economic component in this project is believed to be conceived as a hybrid security development policy initiative. BRI is born out of China's desire to secure its uh, supply chain and access to overseas energy and privacy material market. Um, so the strategic and security aspect is derived from the economic project undertaken to fulfill this requirement. This is further exacerbated by how China's military presence in the Indian Ocean region has become a permanent factor. Uh, so rising tension with the great powers in the Indian Ocean region, the fear of disruption to the supply chain, uh, non-traditional security threats such as Somalian privacy provided the uh, strategic impetus for a permanent deployment of uh, its um, navy in the region. And China deployed, deployed two guided missile destroyers, Wuhan and Haiko, and uh, logistic support ship uh, Bei Shamshu for the protection. So this in a sense points towards the normative uh, practical dictum of flag following trade. As a result of this, Chinese built ports such as Hambantot in Sri Lanka, Mumbai, and Kanya often comes under scrutiny for the possibility of being used for military purposes. The speculations are further aggravated by China's inauguration of its first military support base overseas in Djibouti in 2017, and the Marine Corps have been given the mission of protecting its interests and nationals living abroad. 
both uh, of these initiatives are breaking from its past policies of limiting the de uh, deployment overseas and having overseas cases. Quadrilateral dialogue in comparison is different. It initially began as a military cooperation in 2007 under the designation of quadrilateral defense cooperation. It has gone through various changes over the years, but uh, basically the genesis of a regional security cooperation around the uh, Indo-Pacific region. Even though it is not officially admitted, there is a consensus that the court is born out of the common objective of containing China's uh, growing on influence in the Indian Ocean region. I think uh, uh, Captain Rohan Joseph uh, discussed this in detail in his presentation. Mm. Now, India's affiliation with the court is noteworthy because for decades, India has followed a non-aligned foreign policy and has opposed to any kind of alliance with significant powers. But uh, given its rivalry with China and its opposition to what it sees as China's advances into neighboring countries, especially Pakistan and Sri Lanka, coupled with India's larger strategic goal of becoming a global power, we have motivated to join the quadrilateral grouping. Since gaining momentum, the quad countries have partnered in multiple uh, military drills and joint um, uh, military exercises, including the France-led uh, naval drill in the Bay of Bengal and the Malabar military exercise in the, um, with coordination. So what is interesting is that even though this was initially um, um, developed as a security framework, now we see COD is exploring uh, economic um, engagement in order to counter China in the economic sphere. Especially, Japan has been advocating an alternative to the BRI, which financing the uh, financing that uh, emphasizes quality, and it has established the partnership for quality infrastructure in 2015, increased funding for the extended partnership for quality infrastructure, and uh, collaborated with India to set up the Asia Africa Growth Corridor in 2017. Australia, on the other hand, has set up the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific to fund development activities in the South Pacific area. And uh, in July 2018, Australia, Japan, and the United States set up a trilateral partnership to invest in the Indo Pacific region. Now, we see that with these both countries, even though they initiate with one objective, they are slowly going into the other um, strategic area as well. So what are the implications of this? The emergence of BRI and the COD as competing strategies bring several security implications for this region. And um, these will also impact how small uh, countries will respond to their presence. First and foremost, it is evident that India is using COD as a counterbalancer against China and Beijing's growing influence in this neighborhood. Even though it's, um, the two countries have come into mutual agreement to end military standoff, the damage done from the standoff is irreversible. In a context where every spectrum of the Indian policymakers and strategists promote hardening position on China, New Delhi will use this um, uh, COD initiative to counter Beijing. Uh, now, indeed, China will not welcome and feel pressured and cornered. So it which will eventually put more pressure on small countries in balancing its relationship between the two camps. We already saw a glimpse into this uh, due to the Chinese ambassador's statement in Bangladesh a couple of months ago. The second aspect is that the court will also provide impetus for India to realize its objective of becoming the next security provider in the Indian Ocean region. Since 2013, India has been uh, claiming of being a net security provider in the region. It's closer cooperation with the United States is with this objective. Its role in the court has raised India's status above middle power status and has allowed it to join in the list of great powers, especially United States. As both the court and BRI have competing economic and security agendas and arrangements, this will also lead to pro polarization of the region's security and development policies. Amid this backdrop uh, of an increasing rivalry between the US and China, India and China, and the ongoing geoeconomic competition between Japan and China, 
there is tendency towards mobilizing development policies for increasing strategic purposes. How do we expect the small countries to respond in this situation? This uh, emerging competition between the COD and uh, the BRI mirrors or reflects the existing strategic competition between China and India in South Asia. So therefore, it's more likely for the small countries to perceive a contradictory policy choices or ambiguous security alignments where they try to pitch between the two, uh, two camps. As long as the contains remain at this level, they will succeed in trading between the two arrangements and also, given how China, China's BRI is more attractive for small countries due to lucrative economic offers, hard coming forward with its own economic arrangements uh, give them an opportunity to diverse its uh, uh, chances and it, um, decrease its dependency on China's economic um, uh, offerings. Uh, having card at disposal will also help small countries managing the domestic tension and criticism sometimes they get because of the BRI project. However, in a context where there is an increase in tension and conflict between China and the card countries, hedging might not be a viable strategy. If the countries are forced to choose, they will have to uh, consider the most important strategic concerns. They will, they will even have to ban drugs. This will impact the post called regional order, which promoted separate coexistence of heightened security situations and growing economy in, uh, interdependence. Um, there is also a possibility for small countries to, countries to slightly incline towards calls for emergency security gains. Uh, this is basically due to the role uh, India um, uh, plays in the COD grouping. Even though India is considered as an and hegemonic power in South Asia, its relationship is valued as New Delhi is the first respondent in terms of emergency and security situation for the neighborhood. So in conclusion, the South Asian region undoubtedly need a common security arrangement, but uh, given its issues, it's a very challenging task. Therefore, BRI and COD have the ability to maneuver and uh, become arrangements that are at disposal for the small country. Small states may hedge between BRI and the court to realize uh, their interest depending on the context they need. But India's centrality in the court gives grouping a leverage to establish as a security provider. Thank you very much. I look forward to your um, feedback and questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atanayaka. Uh, for your presentation in um, uh, security implications of COD and BRI in South Asia. Uh, South Asia. Uh, very interesting and timely um, in revisiting the lack of regional security arrangement and the failure of SARC as a regional organization. It has become in ineffective in the light of uh, security challenges at present in South Asia. So thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, ask the questions, uh, you know, uh, later once everybody finished their presentations. My next presenter is uh, in this panel is Niruka Sanjeevani. Niruka is a senior lecturer uh, at the Kotalavra Defense University attached to the Department of International Relations. She has her uh, bachelor's and master's in international relations from the uh, Department of International Relations, University of Colombo. Her research interests include uh, refugee rights, migration, transitional justice, uh, and post-war reconciliation. DGN uh, Sanjeevani, um, please make your uh, research presentation on effective application of international refugee law, the impact of the Palestinians. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Madam, for your impressive introduction. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, today I'm going to talk about effective application of international refugee law, the impact on Palestinians. So. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, with the recent escalation in hostilities between Israelis and Palestinians, actually a uh, number of uh, discourses on the forced displacement of Palestinians uh, have emerged all around the world. That is a known fact. So significantly, uh, it has led to create a kind of legal lacuna uh, which uh, set Palestinians outside the minimal international protection. So that is the uh, background. So within that background, actually, my uh, main objective is to identify how far Palestinians uh, have become victimized uh, due to the Israelis rejections or maybe negligence of international law. Uh, in that case, actually, uh, if, we, if we go back to the, uh, the, the territorial division between Israelis and Palestinians, uh, the UNGA Resolution 181, which was introduced by United Nations General Assembly, uh, mandated, basically it, it allocated 50% uh, uh, areas for Jewish community as well as 40% areas for uh, um, Arabs while uh, keeping Jerusalem as an uncontrolled international zone because of religious importance for both parties. Uh, in that case, actually, um, how this uh, res resolution actually uh, created an impact on both parties, Palestinians and Israelis. It is better to examine that. Uh, if, we, if we analyze that uh, mandate actually, uh, as you can see here though, uh, they introduced that kind of division between Palestinians, basically territorial di uh, division between Palestinians and Israelis. What happened was that uh, if, you uh, if you can uh, go through this picture, you will be able to see how far they have uh, expanded settlements uh, from uh, 1947 to the modern time period. Uh, when they introduced in this mandate, actually the remaining uh, Palestinians were granted citizenship. But once Israelis captured more lands, including Gaza, West Bank, and East Jerusalem, what happened was that they didn't extend their citizenship at all. So in that case, it uh, led to um, create uh, uh, around 10,000 stateless uh, children who were even remain in uh, generations of exile. So that is the background actually. So the next part is that it also led to create a protracted refugee situation in the area. So according to Article 1 of the International Refugee Convention, refugee is a person who is fleeing a well-founded fear of being prosecuted for reasons like race, ethnicity, or membership of a particular social or political group. In that case, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, they define, they define protracted refugee uh, situation, it means PRS, is a situation in which at least 25,000 refugees have been living in exile for more than five consecutive years. In that case, I would like to highlight that Israel is having a kind of liability to welcome refugees who had gone to the countries like, basically neighboring countries like um, Syria, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, and other neighboring countries, uh, and also, Apart from that, they are also obliged to uh, pay compensation for refugees actually who even don't want to return back. Because uh, as you can see here, UN General Assembly Resolution 194 of 1948 says, uh, Palestinian refugees need to be permitted to return to their home at the earliest practicable date and to compensate those who decide not to return back. And again, it was later uh, uh, framed by uh, Security Council Resolution 237 in 1967. The thing is that actually uh, Israeli authorities uh, had rejected any talks on repatriation or, be, uh, or maybe return back these uh, Palestinian refugees, specifically uh, with the UN Conciliation Commission for Palestine. It means they didn't even to negotiate. Uh, so within that context, uh, for 7 million Jewish communities living in the area, the area is a one area. 
and uh, all the restrictions are not visible at all for them. But when it comes to the Arabs, maybe Palestinians, for them restrictions are visible. However, these Palestinians have, be, uh, have been divided into three areas, basically Gaza, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and uh, pa um, occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, however, though these uh, uh, settlements, I mean, they, ha they have given these kind of settlements, what happens is that Israel uh, monitors each and everything, including uh, borders, including resources, including population register, and all. So it has led to restrict their uh, movements as well as their human rights. Restrict their human rights. That is the uh, most important case in that case. So, however, uh, then uh, another question is arised on uh, how far these Palestinian communities, maybe I would say Arab communities, have been protected in this particular area and how, how they have been compensated uh, for the losses that they face. In that case, uh, actually this has been questioned by Human Rights Watch because in 2021, Human Rights Watch uh, they accused Israel of carrying out up that. Um, if we go to, but uh, there are a number of uh, controversies, even uh, discussions have emerged on that uh, particular statement. However, if we go uh, through these the main components, actually in, according to 1973 Apartheid Convention and 1998 Rome Statute of International Criminal Court, uh, this definition includes uh, the intent of one group to dominate other, systematic operation by one racial group over another, one or more inhuman act which includes denying people rights to leave and return to their country, as well as expropriation of landed property. Um, if, we, if we look at this, uh, the first point, the intent of one group to dominate other, it was really, it has been really visible, but um, it also relates to the 20, uh, 2018 nation state law, uh, which says Israel is the nation state of Jewish people. And second one, the right to national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. So then second and third fact, basically uh, the points, actually uh, indicates what I have discussed already because uh, uh, according to the uh, United Nations actually, uh, Palestinian communities had been forced out. Uh, approximately uh, 17,000 Palestinians have, had been forced out when Israel was created in 1948. Um, in that case, uh, they, they, they do not have, I would say, uh, the human rights of these community have been restricted by these Israel communities, uh, Israel authorities. And if we, if we look at the last, uh, last fact, expropriation of landed property, uh, we know the fact that uh, Israel communities uh, are uh, overcrowded by Israel, uh, sorry, Palestinian communities are overcrowded by Israel authorities. And uh, uh, it has, it can be uh, recognized as a kind of practice of encycling them that they can't expand. Uh, within that context, uh, uh, my, my observation is that uh, whatever the uh, factors, uh, uh, relates to this problem, maybe ethnicity, maybe nationality, maybe uh, border issues. I, I specifically stand the fact that Palestinians are citizens, citizens in the sense, I would say, human beings, and citizens of that particular area. They need to have, uh, uh, you know, citizenship because it gives a kind of legal identity for each and every individual. So without a citizenship, actually human being or any individual can't gain any right. And secondly, um, so along with that, actually, I would uh, go to the conclusion. Uh, these, all these discussions and all these facts uh, indicates uh, that Palestinian communities have been victimized since 1948. Uh, and also, they have become a, a stateless community as well as they have been labeled as refugees. Uh, labeling refugees, labeling as refugees, labeling as stateless communities is the worst thing 
uh, one of the worst things uh, that any individual can face. However, uh, within that context, it is uh, required to understand the fact that uh, the first displacement of Palestinians have been exacerbated uh, due to the uh, political and social uh, issues may be realities, complex political and social issues. Uh, it actually uh, shows the idea of uh, Professor Goodwin Goodwinville, uh, which says uh, the term refugee now carries more weight than uh, it did in 1948, because it evokes number of human rights as well as refugees' right to be returned back, because uh, uh, right to be returned <laughs> and try to be compensated is uh, are one of the uh, most important, I would say, um, rights of international uh, refugee law. Basically, uh, all refugees are entitled to have these rights. In, uh, finally, um, this situation is uh, entangled in the right of self-determination of Palestinian communities. And along with that, I would suggest, I mean, I would recommend it is better to have a kind of uh, proper international mechanism to monitor and to uh, observe human rights violation in the area. Basically, again, what uh, human rights violation happened against Palestinians because uh, we saw the role of United Nations is not sufficient at all. And the decisions they have taken from the very beginning, from 1948, have not yet properly considered by Israel authorities. So that is my conclusion. Thank you for hearing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Niruka Sanjeevani. Uh, I think this uh, session would not be completed if there was no paper on the Middle East and geopolitics. So uh, the power struggles in the Middle East were presented uh, by Sanjeevani. Thank you. Um, my next presenter is uh, Trivan Piris. Uh, Trivan Piris um, is at present a communications research program assistant at the Lakshman Kadiragam Institute for International Relations and Strategic Studies. Um, previously, he was the political consultant um, at the Bangladeshi High Commission in Colombo, Sri Lanka. He is also a visiting lecturer at the Bandar Nayaka Center for International Studies. Uh, and he moved from, to international relations, the academic field of international relations, having served in the corporate sector for many years. Um, and you also have a master's in international relations from the University of Colombo. Uh, Trivan Piris will present on the Taiwan issue, exploring the possible standoff between COD and China. So this is the second presentation on COD uh, and China. Thank you, Trivan, and please uh, start your presentation. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Senior Professor Miller for that introduction, um, and uh, to my uh, distinguished panelists, organizers, and everyone present here, good afternoon to you all. Now, my research was influenced by the recent debate in the realm of international relations about uh, possible uh, but an imminent invasion um, of uh, Taiwan by the controversial self-governing island uh, of uh, Taiwan by uh, China. Now, as the title of my uh, presentation uh, suggests, and also as the, as the same topic for my studies of the same uh, this is the same title, uh, it's about understanding if Quad will uh, prevent and also intervene uh, Taiwan from being consolidated into the sovereignty of the People's Republic of China. Now, the two land masses, uh, China and Taiwan, are separated by the Taiwan Strait, as shown in this map. Uh, however, the two countries have been politically divided uh, since 1949. Engagements between Beijing and Taipei is usually referred to as uh, cross-strait relations. Uh, so therefore, before I get into the discussion, of my uh, study. Let me give a briefing on what exactly are the cross-strait relations and its uh, recent developments. Now, at the recently concluded um, 100th anniversary of uh, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, President Xi Jinping made it clear that uh, his administration wishes to unite uh, Taiwan with uh, the People's Republic of China. And this statement was made at, uh, during the backdrop of a growing uh, uh, 
uh, independence uh, movement in Taiwan, and that spearheaded and advocated uh, by the incumbent uh, president of Taiwan, uh, Tsai Ing-wen. Now, I wouldn't get into the history between China and Taiwan, uh, but I would want to comment on the fact that uh, China had made three previous attempts uh, to invade Taiwan. Now, despite its successes and um, uh, setbacks, uh, what is consistent in those three invasions were that uh, China was the, the Chinese uh, growing military strength and also its political confidence. Now, we are not exactly sure as to when this invasion might take place, or also we are not sure if there will be an amphibious attack, or maybe China would use other strategies to kind of subdue Taiwan under its domination. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Washington acts as the greatest impediment for Beijing to realize this uh, vision. Okay, so uh, now moving forward, uh, I'll just try to brief also about the military strength in numbers of the countries that might get involved if uh, this, uh, uh, if an imminent Chinese invasion take place. Now, for the first scenario, uh, uh, let's imagine that Taiwan has to protect itself all by itself from a Chinese invasion. In that case, we see that uh, I mean, the Chinese resources are like substantially greater than Taiwan, and in such a situation, an invasion of Taiwan would be a walk in the park for China. The second scenario, however, is uh, if the United States intervene uh, on behalf of uh, Taiwan. Now, in such a situation, we see that the numbers act in favor of Taiwan. However, we must also uh, understand the fact that the United States wouldn't deploy all of these resources in Taiwan because Washington has other military engagements and commitments around the world. Nevertheless, this would be a very uh, hard fought and close quarter battle. And uh, whoever wins in this would have to suffer severe consequences afterwards. Now, for the third scenario, if Japan, India, and Australia uh, join hands with the United States to intervene militarily on behalf of, uh, of Taiwan, well, in that case, we see, as shown in this purple set of columns, I mean, there's a significant number of uh, military resources adding up. And uh, in such a situation, uh, China invading Taiwan, I mean, deciding even to invade Taiwan would be an attempt of suicide. But in international relations, we cannot uh, kind of uh, understand or kind of kind of, uh, kind of distinguish who the victim might be in such a military conflict because there are other factors that must be taken into consideration. And which is why uh, I would like to now discuss on the nature of the relationships uh, maintained by individual quad members with China and also the most likely policies that they might pursue in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. All right, so these are our four countries, Japan, India, Australia, and the United States. So let us first begin with Japan. Now, for, now Japan, of course, sorry, uh, right. Japan, of course, has, unlike the other three countries, has a direct threat uh, on its sovereignty, and that is due to the island uh, of uh, Yonaguni, which is only about 110 kilometers from the island of Taiwan. If China is successful enough to uh, conquer Taiwan, um, it might also claim ownership of Yonaguni uh, by extending the exclusive economic zone from Taiwan. And this is also the same issue for the disputed islands between Beijing and Tokyo, uh, that is the Senkaku Islands, because those islands too, that island chain is actually closer to Taiwan uh, than to mainland Japan. So uh, in that case, there is a threat uh, for China to kind of, for Japan to even uh, lose uh, its claim on, a, on the ownership of those islands. Nevertheless, this uh, particular imminent threat has also shed a positive light for Japan and that especially for the Liberal Democratic Party that is in power uh, in Japan right now. Uh, one is of course that it, it gives Japan the ability to amend Article 9 of the Japanese constitution. Now, this article specifically states that Japan cannot maintain a military force which is fit for war or to engage in uh, any military engagements. Uh, the second, of course, is that uh, by banking on this particular imminent uh, Chinese invasion or this threat of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan and, and also the threat onto Japanese sovereignty, uh, the ruling Democratic Party can kind of steer nationalism uh, in Japan uh, and we are able to secure a significant majority at the upcoming elections for the Japanese House of Representatives. Also, Japan is uh, a member of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, with China and is also very much integrated economically with China. 
However, due to the fact that uh, the Chinese invasion of Taiwan would uh, kind of uh, have implications for Japanese sovereignty, uh, the study concludes that uh, Japan will get involved uh, militarily in this if, if in a situation where China invades Taiwan. Our next country is, of course, India. Now, India is a very unique country in this defense alliance because it is the only developing nation state, whereas other three are not. And also, India adheres to a non-aligned foreign policy. India was the first country to uh, recognize uh, relationships diplomatically with the People's Republic of China. And also, India voted for the UN resolution in 1971, uh, accepting PRC's admission into the United Nations, where the other three countries in this defense alliance clearly did not. Uh, and India's non-aligned foreign policy further complicates matters because uh, India is also a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, a defense alliance game in which uh, China and Russia are influential members. Uh, then, of course, India is also the only country in what the shares a land border with China. And this is far from a peaceful land uh, border. Uh, there are disputes over three fronts. Um, and also given the fact that Taiwan is beyond India's immediate sphere of influence, it is unlikely that India would deploy forces in a distant um, kind of location and, 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 and also due to the instability in Afghanistan and China's growing presence in the Indian Ocean. It is likely that New Delhi would prefer consolidating its military resources close to home. Uh, nevertheless, Quad, of course, brings in a lot of advantages for India, especially in the economic fronts. Um, there is a lot of investments from these uh, Quad members to India, in, and these are in sectors of agriculture, education, renewable energy, and also in health. Uh, so, of course, if there is an imminent Chinese invasion, India might not directly get involved militarily, but would, of course, support Quad in the capacity of a logistics hub. Um, and also might engage in kind of deception strategies where they might create issues in the border to kind of uh, deviate Beijing's attention solely on Taiwan, but also on the border. So given that, it is likely that India would not engage militarily um, in this situation. Then, of course, our third member, and that is Australia. Now, unlike Japan and India, Australia has, and currently there exists a security agreement, ANZUS, with uh, the United States and New Zealand. Now, this defense alliance is not as binding as NATO. However, Canberra has always come up to, uh, has risen to the occasion and has uh, obliged whenever the United States engages in a military expedition overseas. Uh, examples include the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and also the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so there's a long-standing history of uh, Australian uh, experience uh, in combat military operations with the United States. Uh, then, of course, uh, unlike the other three countries in this alliance, Australia has uh, is, is very deeply integrated uh, with China uh, economically uh, and also is a member in the regional uh, economic partnership uh, like Japan. Uh, now, there is a very strong uh, uh, Australians of Taiwanese descent who kind of lobby Canberra to engage militarily in this conflict. But despite that, uh, there is this large uh, public and very strong public opinion in Australia, uh, a majority of them kind of uh, who showing the dissatisfaction for Australia to engage uh, in this particular conflict if it takes place because Taiwan is beyond Australia's immediate Southeast Asian neighborhood. Uh, so as uh, uh, India... Australia, too, in that case, might support Quad in a, as a logistics uh, hub uh, in this conflict uh, if it takes place. However, the main dilemma for Australia would be the long-standing defense alliance with the United States um, versus uh, its economic, vital economic partnership uh, with China. Uh, policy experts and other think tanks have, of course, advised Australia, therefore, to kind of act as a mediator between uh, India and uh, Taiwan. Uh, to bring about an amicable solution between these two uh, countries rather than engage directly uh, militarily if a conflict takes place. So similarly, uh, for Australia, the Canberra also would not engage militarily in this conflict. Then, of course, the most powerful uh, country alliance and the country that keeps this whole alliance together is the United States. Now, of course, the United States is legally bound to protect Taiwan according to the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979. 
Um, but more so, it also wants to preserve American interest in the Asia Pacific. Now, what is also important is that Taiwan is home to uh, TSMC, which is a Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company. And this company alone produces over 60% of the world's microchips. And these microchips are used in um, American high-tech companies such as Apple, AMD, Intel, Dell, HP, and so on. So if China is successful in um, invading Taiwan, Beijing would have a monopoly over this uh, industry. And that is something the United States would clearly not want to see happening. Um, then, of course, the Americans would also want to kind of demonstrate superiority and uh, also, also kind of showcase its reliability as a, a security and defense partner to its neighbors in Asia as well. So, so engaging militarily is very important for the United States to kind of uh, uh, demonstrate its power in the region. And also, most importantly, U.S. ambiguity, U.S. policy ambiguity on China and Taiwan. So this has also kind of resulted... Uh, in securing Taiwan as a, as a major uh, weapons export market for the United States by always banking on this imminent uh, threat of a Chinese invasion. So for the United States, they will engage militarily. So now if I have to conclude this study, uh, I must say that uh, if China invades Taiwan in the near future, of course, uh, uh, what will get engaged, but in different capacities. So Japan and the United States are willing and will get involved militarily, but uh, India and Australia will largely support on the sidelines and would not engage militarily. So uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, attention. If you do have any questions, please do ask during the question and answer session, and I would be glad to answer them all. Thank you. Thank you, Trivan. Thank you very much for that detailed introduction of the quadrilateral partners and also who will and who will not engage militarily. Um, so thank you for that very, uh, you know, um, insightful presentation. Thank you. My next presenter, the final in this uh, session, uh, is by Asanta Seniviratna, who is currently a lecturer uh, in the Department of Strategic Studies at, uh, at the Kotalavla Defense University. He has his uh, bachelor's from Peradeniya and master's in international relations from the University of Colombo. And he's currently a doctoral candidate at the same department, University of Colombo. And his research interests are in geopolitics and area studies. Over to Asanta Seniviratna to make your presentation on geopolitics of Russia, a struggle linked to geography and global dominance. The floor is yours, uh, Asanta Seniviratna. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the introduction. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a nice time to have a presentation uh, just before the lunch. Uh, but anyway, this is my topic, uh, the geopolitics of Russia, a struggle linked to geography and global dominance. Now, recently, in April uh, 2021, this year, the Russian president uh, at the uh, State of Nations speech mentioned that uh, he gave a warning to the West due to the tensions that the Russians had with the West, he mentioned we don't uh, want to burn bridges, but if somebody interprets our good intentions as weakness, our reaction will be asymmetrical, rapid, and harsh. Uh, we'll decide for ourselves in each case where the red line is. So this was a warning that given to the West uh, due to the, you know, the geopolitical pressure that uh, was exerted by United States and other Western countries. Uh, and many issues, especially re uh, related to Ukraine. But uh, uh, when new U.S. president was elected, Joe Biden, he had a meeting with the Russian president uh, in Switzerland uh, in uh, June, uh, aiming to uh, lower the tensions between the West uh, and Russia. They achieved some, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 things there, but not a total. Uh, uh, normalization of relations. Uh, then the background to this research is based on the geography of Russia. Why? Uh, Russia is the largest country in the world. Uh, it is um, uh, so large uh, uh, during at its peak during the Soviet times, Russia represented one seventh of the uh, global land area. But after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia is not considered a superpower but a great power. 
it has moved from a superpower uh, to a great power. But still, due to its size uh, and uh, uh, geography, it needs to uh, maintain a sphere of influence regionally as well as in a, in a global level. Uh, then on the other hand, the global superpower, United States and the world order led by the United States, uh, want to contain uh, Russia. Uh, even after Cold War, the containment policy is being implemented. Uh, then uh, Russia also have a very powerful military. Uh, it has the largest uh, uh, stockpile of uh, nuclear warheads. Uh, it has uh, 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 intercontinental ballistic missiles. It, it has uh, uh, hypersonic uh, missiles. And uh, it, it has a very powerful military. In that sense, it's a, a, a military power. Russian economy is uh, much of a debatable uh, uh, concept because uh, uh, in some aspect Russia has a very strong economy because it does not have large amount of external debt. At the same time it has large amount of uh, foreign reserves and it has a huge surplus when it comes to international trade. But still Russian economy is small. It is the 11th largest economy in nominal GDP in the world. Even smaller countries like uh, Germany, Italy, UK is now uh, bigger, have a bigger economy than Russia. So it has not achieved the per capita income level as the Western countries, so it's a weak point. Uh, the research question is related to the why geography of Russia is contributing to the political tensions with the West. Uh, what are the geopolitical strategies of West in containing Russian sphere of influence and how Russia is implementing geopolitical strategies to maintain its sphere of influence. Methodology, this is an exploratory research, qualitative uh, data uh, based on secondary sources, and heartland theory is uh, 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 taken as a theoretical background. Uh, then the heartland theory uh, was presented by Sir Halford Mackinder, who is considered to be the father of geopolitics, who lived in Britain. Uh, during the uh, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, he identified an area called Heartland and he also presented this land power theory uh, uh, that uh, meant that there's one uh, important pivot area. Whoever controls that area will be able to dominate the world politics. So he presented an article called Geographical Pivot of History in 1904. Then he uh, improved that uh, and named as the democratic ideals and reality in 1919. There he mentioned this. Who rules the East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. Who rules the world island commands the world. Now this heartland is located, uh, much of heartland is located in, in, in Russia. Uh, therefore, whoever wanted to dominate the world wanted to you know, capture Russia and control Russia. Uh, but uh, there are, there are uh, historical events like uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte wanted to invade Russia and later Hitler also, uh, keeping in mind the heartland theory, wanted to uh, invade Russia, but both failed due to the factor, the climate factor. Climate factor sometimes is a plus point to Russia, sometimes it's a negative point. Uh, so, climate have played an important role in, in Russia's, uh, you know, in related to Russia's interest in power. This is the heartland. What it uh, says is briefly, whoever controls this heartland will have the access to largest amount of natural resources in the world. Uh, using these natural resources, whoever controls this area can industrialize quickly uh, and uh, become relatively more powerful to the rest of the world and by building railroads and others, infrastructure, they can enter to the inner crescent, that is uh, Asia, Middle, uh, Asia and Europe. This is called the world island and from there, using naval power, they can expand their dominance to the rest of the world. Of course, Soviet Union, during the Soviet time, Soviet Union became a superpower uh, uh, base of that was the natural wealth that the Soviet Union had. Even now, Russia have 72 trillion worth of natural resources according to the World Bank, uh, by far the largest amount of uh, natural resources by uh, which uh, to any country. Uh, then, uh, 
Russia and the West, there's a history. Uh, there was a, a rivalry between the British Empire and Russia, the great game during the 18th and 19th centuries, then famously the Cold War. Uh, George of Kennan uh, highlighted through Article X that they need to contain uh, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union at that time. Then the Truman policy came up uh, with that uh, creation of NATO. All these things was uh, targeted at containing the Soviet Union. But uh, it was not only geopolitics, it was an ideological battle between the communism and capitalism. Then why after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they are maintaining this, they are continuing with the containment policy. Uh, the, the main tool of uh, West to contain Russia is the expansion of NATO to the eastward. And uh, to uh, face this, Russia also is taking counteractions. Now, this is NATO, uh, a direct byproduct of Cold War, which was created in 1949 to contain the Soviet Union. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they still kept on expanding NATO uh, making a serious, serious threat to the Russian national security. Uh, when Russia was weak, some of the former Warsaw Pact countries were taken into the NATO, like the Poland, uh, Romania, Bulgaria. Then later, countries like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, which, which was part of Soviet Union itself, was taken into NATO. There's one important thing in these countries. One third of the population in these Baltic countries are Russians. So it has a huge impact on Russia when the NATO forces are, uh, are established uh, in, in these Baltic countries. Then when Russia was weak, they, they were able to expand NATO. But when Putin, President Putin came into power, uh, Russia econo Russia's economic grew and the power of Russia also increased. The result was uh, in 2008, uh, when Georgia uh, sent their forces to uh, suppress the insurgency in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, in, in some way supported by West, the Russians intervened and stopped it. Uh, then they sent the military to Abkhazia and Ossetia, which have ethnic linkages to Russia, and they have declared independence, but not largely recognized by most of the countries in the world. But this is an intervention by Russia in 2008 against the expansionism of the West. They, but the most important rift in the in recent times came under the Ukraine crisis in the 2013-14 uh, era. Uh, the pro-Russian uh, President Viktor Yanukovych uh, neglected, uh, you know, uh, uh, agri economic agreement that was supposed to sign with the European Union under the pressure of Russia. Then people started demonstrating with the support of the West. Uh, then he had to go back to Russia. There was a large governmental change in Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine is the most strategically most important country for Russia in its uh, buffer zone. Uh, and Russia immediately annexed Crimea, uh, where it had uh, naval bases that is uh, strategically located in the Black Sea. And also there's an insurgency happening in uh, Russian, uh, you, know, you know, where ethnic Russians are living like Donetsk and uh, Luhansk, uh, say. It, they were supported by the Russians, but Russia denied that. But anyway, Ukraine, nearly 20% of the people are ethnic Russians, and most of the people speak Russian. So there's a big uh, rivalry between the West and uh, Russia in the Ukraine. Then uh, the Russian reaction, again, uh, uh, of course, with the Ukraine crisis, United States and the European Union put sanctions on Russia, which ha is having a big impact on the Russian economy since 2014. Then again, um, uh, Russia anyway wanted to develop economic relations because there are some countries like Germany, France, who wants better relations with Russia. Uh, it again, Russia have a very important tool to develop relations with the European Union, that is the Russian oil and gas. Then uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, show their interest in global issues, they intervened in Syria in 2015. Then Russia is slowly uh, developing a strategic partnership with China, uh, again, uh, the, uh, for a very long time, uh, climate issues was, uh, have, was having an impact on Russia on exploring resources in uh, uh, Siberia and Arctic. But with the global warming and climate change, they can now uh, get, uh, ha can have easy access to much of the resources. Uh, now you see uh, here, uh, 
it is not US that Russia's biggest economic partner, it is the European Union. So uh, they, it's, it's not only on Russia that have an impact uh, due to the sanctions, even European Union is suffering to some extent. So therefore they want to develop better economic relations. And also 30% uh, of the gas to the Europe comes through Russia. So there's a sort of a dependency on the Russian gas. Uh, and most importantly, the most important um, country, economic power in uh, Europe, Germany, 40% of the gas to Germany is, comes from Russia. Uh, now in this background, Russia also is building uh, new pipelines to Europe, famously the Norad Stream 2, uh, uh, avoiding uh, Ukraine uh, to Germany, uh, then again, another Turk stream to the southern Europe into uh, the European Union. If, if this happens, uh, the Ukraine will uh, largely lose the, uh, the oil transit, uh, you know, income uh, uh, through uh, oil and gas supplies to Ukraine to the European uh, Union. The Trump's, uh, Trump administration wanted to put some sanctions on Russia, but uh, under the new Joe Biden administration, he has mentioned he want to remove sanctions and allow uh, to uh, go ahead with the project because it's not viable to US to send the gas to uh, Europe through the Atlantic, it will cost more. Uh, then again, uh, he got, uh, the Russia got involved in Syria, that is uh, to show that uh, their sphere of influence is uh, 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 global uh, and uh, the involvement of in uh, Syria changed the uh, scenario there. Uh, Bashar al-Assad was able to hang on to power due to the Russian intervention uh, and at the same time Russia is um, working closely with Iran and Turkey where the western countries find some difficulties uh, uh, in their relations and at the same time in 2018 uh, Russia sent uh, its uh, nuclear powered bomber, long range bomber called uh, 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 to uh, uh, Venezuela in, uh, to show support to the Venezuelan government at that time who are, uh, who are um, you know, having problems with the uh, United States. Uh, uh, United States was pressuring Venezuela for a government change at that time in 2018. Uh, then uh, they are developing a strategically important partnership with China. This is a very, uh, uh, you know, a major challenge to the US-led uh, world order. Uh, they are annually having military exercises. Uh, Russia is a big part of uh, Belt and Road Initiative of China and at the same time recently uh, they opened a new uh, oil pipeline uh, from Siberia to Russia uh, that will expand in time to come. So, so they are, uh, uh, the China-Russia relation is a strategic partnership that sort of challenge uh, the Western dominant world order uh, uh, and uh, it will, uh, the, the, the strategic partnership will increase. Uh, in time to come. Uh, then uh, Russia is also uh, aiming at developing this northern sea route to the Arctic. Now uh, the climate change and global warming is, uh, is supporting uh, Russia's um, uh, you know expansion of its power because for a very long time they could not explore some of the resources because of the ice cover and the long winters uh, in the far east Russia, but now uh, they can explore those resources more and also the ice covered uh, sea routes is opening up due to the global warming. Now uh, Russia is uh, 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 investing heavily in building uh, a sea route uh, which connects Euro uh, Europe with East Asia. Uh, the distance from Japan to uh, Land, uh, uh, UK through the normal sea route through the Indian Ocean and through the Mediterranean Sea is somewhat 11,300 nautical miles. But when, if this uh, northern sea route becomes fully operational, it will reduce to 7,600 nautical miles and at the same time it will benefit the development of Russia and uh, it will contribute to the improvement of the Russian economy. Uh, and uh, many countries like uh, India and China are investing uh, in this northern sea route uh, that will help Russia to improve its power. Ashanta, can you please conclude yes. your presentation? Yeah. Uh, as the conclusion, I would like to mention Russia is the largest country in the world and has the largest reserves of natural resources in the world. As suggested by Heartland theory and historical facts, 
It is natural for Russia to make strategies towards global dominance or to maintain global sphere of influence. However, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, United States and West continues to contain Russian sphere of influence. Though Russia has abundance of natural resources and a powerful military, climate conditions, demographic issues, size of the economy are constraints for it to expand its sphere of influence. Seeking better economic relations with the West, building a strategic partnership with China, working towards the Eurasian Union, taking opportunities provided by climate change remains important elements for expansion of Russia's sphere of influence in the future. Finally, the geography of Russia is always a push factor for greater power and greater sphere of influence in the world. However, geography of Russia also makes it neighbors and competing powers to adopt a policy of containment depending on the prevailing regional and global geopolitics. Thank you very much. Uh, these are my references. I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, and all the best with your doctoral studies. So what I would do is I don't, we are very uh, close to the time and also it's the lunch time. I will give one minute to each of the presenters in one minute, please comment. Uh, try and answer the questions that came through the chat and also give us take home points. Okay, thank you. So we go first with uh, Captain Rohan Joseph, Ganeshan, Chulani, Niruka, and Asanta. Oh, sorry, uh, thank you, Rohan. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. There was a question from Charana regarding my right alignment. Well, uh, the my right alignment comes with uh, certain caveats as well. Uh, right alignment essentially does not mean uh, in my context that it, you should, you know, basically what I was really meant to say was economical aspects should be taken positively. But the security concerns, if there are security concerns, especially we have to be worried about India. So Indian concerns are very high and top on the list. But on the economic lines, I, I should say we should get maximum benefits, whichever comes, uh, provided that they do not bring in any security concerns as well. And there was a question from you, ma'am, as well, with regard to the choke points in the Indian Ocean. Well, I see uh, if the choke points are being, you know, kind of blocked or due to uh, certain groups clashing each other, there will be certain um, uh, disturbances of these groups. Half of the world will for surely starve and the rest half will freeze. That's for sure. And uh, economic trade and energy will, you know, completely go haywire. But what I want to really highlight here is now, taking uh, control of one strategic choke point does not make a really uh, 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 groundbreaking uh, uh, mark for any, any country. There are nine uh, choke points basically coming to looking at the Indian Ocean. So if you have to take one, uh, that does not really make sense in you know controlling other eight. So it's, it's, a, it's a big task of controlling the entire nine as well. Let's assume that the entire nine is gone, but still, as uh, the last presenter uh, highlighted, there's always the Northern Sea Route. And there are uh, countries uh, very positive, especially Russia and uh, China, very positive looking at these lines. And I wonder whether we are going to lose the significance of Indian Ocean in the future as well, because it's going to go away. So uh, let's see how things move on. And we always have a uh, uh, option two, three, and four as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Vignaraja. Thank you, uh, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so my uh, first point, I guess, is that how Sri Lanka and other small powers manage their relations with uh, great powers, such as the US and China, will determine their prosperity, uh, particularly as we are looking towards post-COVID recovery, uh, which is really fundamental if uh, small countries want to become rich in the future. And that, that's really fundamental. Uh, the second uh, point I want to make is really, um, you know, we have spent a lot of time looking at political and security considerations, which I think are very important, but in small countries, uh, which was enormously scarred by the COVID pandemic, um, this dimension of economic security really needs to now be looked at. Otherwise, uh, there is very little prospect for recovery. Um, and in the Sri Lankan case, uh, you know, we are facing a very high level of debt um, which is probably going to hamper our um, recovery if we uh, don't uh, attempt to uh, manage this well. And one aspect of that management is really how we manage China and the US. 
And um, I, I think uh, we have to be uh, really take, I think my final point is really, we just have to take a very hard cost benefit analysis now, uh, looking at these relations as to what each brings and how is it that we mitigate the risks? The point of my presentation was partly to shock everyone, but also partly to bring the reality of where we are. And uh, we need to do some new thinking if we really want to become rich. You know, President Gotabe has talked about us uh, becoming a country of six and a half thousand dollars growing at 6%. And I share that vision. You know, I think it would be great. Thank you, uh, my Dr. problem Dr. is how do we arrive there? And, and that's what I want to say. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Chulani uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Derek. Uh, two questions, I think I'll try to briefly answer. One is about um, whether China's, uh, I mean, cause uh, has lost uh, or already lost its primary objective because China is moving ahead with uh, different activities like AI, different identification, drone, etc. Uh, I think in my opinion, you can't say completely uh, the, the objectives are completely disregarded because um, even though the idea of COD came in 2007 and it came some, it took some time to get the momentum. And now there is a momentum and they do a lot of activities and definitely China is uh, impacted from this development. That's why you see a reaction from China and China makes statements uh, in response to what is happening with the COD. So that itself, I think, is making a statement that so that uh, even though they may have not been able to completely prevent whatever China is doing, at least they are giving a message that they are, we, we, we have concerns on what is happening. So therefore, China will have to be extra careful in whatever it is doing in Indian Ocean and other parts of the region. And then there was another question about whether the China will go ahead with the securitizing of trade routes will be more expensive process and whether it's sustainable. But when I say secure China using BRI as a security framework, I don't, I don't necessarily mean that China is going to deploy its Navy and has naval bases, etc. etc. China is using economic incentives uh, to influence its partner countries to support in the context of a conflict. And it also shows some influence when small countries sort of uh, try its relationship with the uh, opposing camp. For instance, as we saw in the case of Bangladesh, where China Chinese ambassador uh, openly sort of like gave a warning statement about joining a, a narrow, early purposed grouping, etc. So I don't think China will uh, follow a similar strategy like the United States where it's trying to base its uh, troops elsewhere else. The final uh, question is from you about what would be the worst case scenario. I think uh, Captain Joseph explained it uh, in detail. Uh, just to add one point, I think for countries like Sri Lanka, if we be, if we, um, be honest, this competition has some advantage. We have the option of playing one against the other and we get um, to uh, maneuver the situation and get our economic and security interests realized. So uh, having a completely non-conflict scenario will not be a uh, good... Um, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atanayak. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Atanayak. May I now uh, move on to Trivan Anarkarage? You had two names put in your uh, abstract, it was Piris, and then your bio, it's something else. So that's why I took the easy way out and called you Piris. That, that's okay, right, that's Chivan, right. one minute. Okay, right. So I just quickly answer the question uh, forwarded by Mr. Charana. So his question was whether the United States and Japan has taken um, uh, the, uh, potential, uh, what do you call it, uh, opportunity cost of engaging in a war. So um, the thing here is that both Japan and the United States would bank on the constraints of China while coming into this, while engaging in this war. So four quick points that I want to mention. The first is the defense budgets. The United States, of course, so has about 140 billion of its defense budget, but China only has uh, 180 and Japan 51. If Japan is to engage, of course, they can extend it to another about 100 billion. Uh, two is, of course, if China is successful, they would inherit a very hostile population in Taiwan. And Taiwan is very, very far from mainland China. It's not like Hong Kong. So there will always be time and access um, to uh, Japan and uh, the United States to consolidate its resources around it. 
Number three, of course, is uh, it's an amphibious attack if it's an invasion, and Taiwan, being a country, has very it doesn't have enough beaches for an amphibious attack. It's it's a very mountainous terrain. Be pretty difficult for China to kind of invade Taiwan in in that sense. Uh, then, of course, the last one, and I mentioned that the other two quad members, India and uh, Australia, might act as uh, logistics hubs. But despite those two countries, you also have other allies in in, in Southeast Asia, such as Vietnam and Philippines. Who might also act as uh, hubs for um, uh, for Japan and the United States, given the fact that even those two countries are threatened by uh, Chinese expansion into the South um, China Sea. So yeah, that's, so that's my answer. I hope that was concise enough. And thank right. you. Thank you very much. And Asanta Seniviratna, there is a question to you uh, on chat box. If you can answer, please. Uh, why mm -hmm. Russia is worried about Islamic radicalization moving towards Central Asia after the fall of Afghan government? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I can see the question. Um, yes, Russia is also worried because 7% of the Russian po population is uh, Muslims and they have experiences uh, related to, uh, you know, uh, Chechnya and the southern, uh, you know, uh, republics of Russia. And also, uh, Russia uh, is uh, approaching this issue to the Central Asia with, Kaz you know, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. There is a large uh, ethnic representation of Tajiks and Uzbeks in uh, Afghanistan. Through that, uh, they have uh, some sort of uh, wider influence in Afghanistan. And also, right. Ru yeah. Russia is dealing with Taliban. Uh, according to the American intelligence, they have some sort of uh, uh, connection to Taliban. Uh, I think they will work with all these parties to ensure the security of Russia, uh, especially with Central Asian republics and also to some extent with Taliban. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Asanta. And uh, Niruka Sanjeevani, uh, just uh, can you comment on the application of international refugee law on the Afghan refugees that are, you know, that went to US and other parts of Europe, etc. Do you have any comments on that, please? Yes, madam. Thank you very much uh, for your question. Actually, it's a very uh, good uh, question because nowadays, uh, when it comes to the modern international uh, system, I would say, world community, uh, two uh, problems are there, two main uh, problems that relate to refugees. One is uh, basically the ongoing uh, uh, situation in Afghanistan, and then second, uh, that I have pointed out as Palestinians and Israeli problems. So I would say, uh, yes, um, nation states, even international organizations have promoted number of, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms in promoting international refugee law. And some of the states have also uh, become signatories to uh, 1951 International Refugee Convention and Protocol. But the problem is uh, how far they have uh, implemented or accepted those kind of uh, norms, maybe uh, the regulations. So, so I would like to uh, compare this uh, Afghan issue and the Palestine issue specifically uh, with respect to the role of United States, because uh, United States actually having uh, playing a very uh, major role in these uh, two issues. So. Um, well, uh, if, we, if we go to the Palestinian issue and this uh, Afghanistan issue, actually, uh, United States uh, actually uh, remained as the strong supporter for Israel, uh, even since the Blink Bill Clinton time period. So then, uh, again, uh, when it comes to the uh, Trump's time period, actually, the relations was actually uh, quite challenged because his decisions on uh, Israel's uh, foreign policy, basically he uh, named um, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and also um, he moved U.S. embassy uh, into the area. So therefore... Uh, okay, okay, Sanjeevani, yeah. I think uh, since we are arriving out of time, I hope you all will investigate further and come up with new research on this because these are new areas that yeah. are emerging. So um, thank you, all the presenters. Thank you very much, the audience. I'm, I'm amazed that, you know, most of you remained. I mean, it's over 70 uh, people. We started with 100 people. So thank you for the audience first. And thank you, all the presenters, for disseminating your new knowledge in this uh, research you presented today under the uh, technical session two themes, your politics and strategic groupings.
by Captain Rohan Joseph, Dr. Ganeshan Vignaraja, Dr. Chulani Attanayaka, and senior lecturers Niruka Sanjeevani and senior lecturer Asanta Senimiratna and uh, Trivan Piris from their KI communications program assistant. So your presentations, I must say overall, excellent presentation, in-depth research and uh, PowerPoint presentations of very high quality because you, so, one can do very good research, but also presenting is also very important. I hope all of you will, uh, publish your new knowledge, this research for greater audience. Good luck to all of you and well done. And thank you, Brigadier Rajapaksha, Dean FGS, my counterpart at Kotalavala Defense University, uh, Dr. Bhagya Senaratna and the technical team who helped me in this session. Thank you so much and thank you for inviting me. And I always get the session before lunch for some reason. Thank, thank you, you, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you, madam. Thank you, madam. That was a very interesting and timely discussion that looked at the geopolitical constructs of regional groupings such as the Kurd strategic competition in various land and ocean spaces. I'm confident our audience has enjoyed the session. I would like to thank the chairperson, senior professor, Naini Melagoda, once again for gracing the 14th International Research Conference despite her busy schedule. I would also like to thank the presenters of the second technical session for Defense and Strategic Studies, R. Joseph, Jivigna Raja, C. Attanayaka, DGN Sanjeevani, ACT Piris, S. N. Vratna for sharing their research findings on the theme Geopolitics and Strategic Groupings. Now, I would like to call upon Brigadier R.G.U. Rajapaksha, RSP, PSC, Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, to present the certificates of participation for this session to DGN Sanjeevani and S. N. Viratna. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we come to the second technical session for defense and strategic studies for the 14th International Research Conference. <laughs>